After the weather turning sour last week at Manham, we began the final leg of our trip down the Murray before reaching Lake Alexandrina. This end of the river is quite different to the upper reaches, but the scenery is nonetheless unique. Just prior to reaching Murray Bridge is the pumping station where Adelaide's water begins its journey through the hills to Mount Bold. As we rounded the final bend, there was the familiar Murray Bridge. Well, Murray Bridge has been a bit underestimated in its uh, history over the last few years. A very substantial port in its day. In the 1920s, up to 20 steamers and barges were recorded loading and unloading cargo across the wharf. Some of the old skippers' uh, claim was the largest grain port in South Australia outside of Port Adelaide. Well, it certainly was a uh rather a fiasco at the start to get a, a bridge across the bridge here, what ultimately became Murray Bridge. The actual bridge construction occurred in around about 1873 because that's when the foundation stone was laid and of course Murray Bridge didn't exist at this period of time. In fact the name Murray Bridge didn't become officially recognised till about 1940. When it actually started off it wasn't built for people or anything, there was no town in Murray Bridge so in 1879 in March it was uh, informally opened. 1868 trains started to go across this particular bridge till the rail bridge was uh, built in, uh, started in 1924. Well there is one myth of uh, one of the workers uh, being buried in one of the pylons. Gene Smile did the research on it and there's no truth in the rumour. It's an absolute myth. The changes to Murray Bridge in the past few years have been quite noticeable with much more time and money being spent upgrading the foreshore. There's still plenty of fascinating images from an era gone by and havens for the many different types of craft found around Murray Bridge. For the past week, I had been telling Dean about this old steel cruiser type thing I had bought and was planning to renovate. And today was the presentation to my first mate. Dean suggested my new purchase looked more like a cross between Popeye and a car accident than a boat. But despite these words, this was the vessel that would take us across the lake. What's he done? We hitched on the FAB camera boat and set off into the night. We wanted to hit the lake early the next morning, as it can get quite ugly as winds pick up during the course of a day. And apart from this, we had to catch up our schedule completely from some of our earlier dilemmas. Very well, thanks, David. How are you getting off? Yeah, good, thanks. Listen, we're just about to go across Lake Alexandrina. Just wondering if you'd give us a bit of a weather update. The next morning found us at Wellington Marina, where my boat had originally come from. Unfortunately, the marina does not operate commercially anymore, but plays host to a housing estate and a few residential boats. The entrance to Lake Alexandrina is not far from Wellington, and you can tell you're getting close by the amount of fishing nets that start to appear along the banks. As we caught our first glimpse of the lake, you could feel the gentle swells already starting to push up the river. Lake Alexandrina has a notorious reputation and anyone thinking of making the trip should make sure they have done a few rehearsals first. Even at 7am the water was becoming a bit confused with an exposed southerly picking up. This was the first test for my 18 ton old girl and her somewhat interesting looking bow configuration and so far she was doing just fine. It's a bit hard to pick up the size of the waves on camera and Dean refused to get out for a shot but the further we progressed the more the winds picked up and with only 15 to 17 knots of breeze blowing, the lake was still less than pleasant. The lake averages two to four metres of water in depth and is over 25 kilometres across. You cannot see the other side until you are some way into the crossing. There is little in the way of passing traffic and almost no shelter except for a small marina at Poltullock and the entrance to Lake Albert at Narung, where you can hide behind the ferry. On a good day, the lake is magnificent and on a bad one, it makes the sea seem kind. As Dean was wandering around the boat for a few shots and a general check, he discovered something a little strange. The FAB camera boat had decided she'd had enough of the constant pounding and let go. With my sleek speed machine wound up at around eight knots, we had trouble catching the bayliner as she sailed beam on to the waves. I would have filmed Dean's transfer onto the runaway craft, but we had a bit of trouble aligning the two craft with the wave action and the speed differences. Anyway, we survived the ordeal and we brought her back on tow. At the northwestern corner of the lake is Malang. Malang is the only town on the shores of Lake Alexandrina. It was uh, established in around 1850. The water's in close here, uh, good for skiing, fairly sheltered. Uh, there is actually a reedy island. The jetty itself 
It's got reasonably deep water, six foot deep. In the early days, the mail run used to come from Adelaide up on Cobb Co coach. It had stop off points on the way from Malang. It used to get on the paddle steamers and go across Lake Alexandrina, across Lake Albert to Meningi, from Meningi down through to Melbourne. Uh, tourists are definitely most welcome in Malang. It's a town full of history and it's well worth a trip. On a choppy day, it is important to keep someone on watch for the many long nets set across the lake, old fence posts and ensure landmarks are where they're supposed to be. Point Sturt is the first major landmark as you reach the other side of the lake, meaning that calm water isn't too far away. The first sign of civilisation is Clayton Bay, the home of Henry Jones, a well-known fishing identity. Captain Sturt uh, named Clayton um, when he came down to Murray and uh, the carpet on the boat was called Clayton and uh, in honour of the work that Clayton did, Sturt named this town after him. The last six years has been the best I can remember in my uh, 40 years of fishing. About 15 years ago we, we got this idea going of putting fish gates in, in the barrages so that the Mulloway and, and all, all the other species can get back into the fresh water and do all these things that they've been doing for thousands of years. Everybody's in favour of it and uh, I believe it's going to happen in the next few years. Well, it works, it works on a lunar cycle. When, when, when the, uh, the Coorong is about the same height as, as the freshwater, so the saltwater and the freshwater are about the same height, then an automatic gate will come in and that'll go up. No, no water will go back and forwards because they're both the same level and the fish can go in and out and then it'll just close down automatically. The fish are there now. So they're, they're there now waiting right at those barrages because a little bit of sweet, sweet water seeps through and they're waiting there trying to get, get in there. And what a fantastic night to arrive. The people at the marina on High Marsh Island had promised a return to the good weather and it seemed they would deliver. Tomorrow would see us explore the finis.